Next Tuesday, Lester Pickett celebrates his 50th birthday just a week after his final race in Britain. One person who knows him better than most is the BBC's voice of racing, Peter O'Sullivan. My first memory of Lester Pickett was of a rather moon-faced lad with the expression of a willful cherub, possibly a little more willful than angelic. Looking back through my cuttings for 1950, I was already apologising to my readers for repetitive reference to the brilliance of this 14-year-old apprentice. His style, a blend of subtlety and sometimes dangerously fierce intensity. In the early 50s, after the flat season's opening meeting at Lincoln, Lester and I would drive to entry, pausing en route for already a very, very frugal dinner. It is a fact of Lester Pickett's remarkable racing life that if he had not begun his sustained battle with the scales at such a tender age, he could never have conditioned his five feet seven and a half inch frame to operate with lasting brilliance at 21 pounds below his bodily norm. Lester has always communicated better with horses than humans. Constant darting probably isolated him further. But alone, he is an engaging companion with a subtle sense of humor. Looking to the future, it'll be intriguing to see how he adapts his intuitive understanding of horses to training. Looking back, he can reflect on one racing certainty. No British-born jockey ever achieved such richly deserved international acclaim. How we shall miss the name L. Pickett in the Runners and Riders Board. Still, the indelible image of that unique style will remain forever. man at a lonely private job. More than likely, this is the very best horseman riding by there has ever been. For well over a quarter of a century, he has entranced the very spirit of his nation. Well, here comes Lester Pickett on Lejinski. Lejinski coming and taking up from here and racing up towards the line. It's a bit for Lester Pickett. Lejinski got clear. Lejinski's the winner. Four cash, three pounds. Only one thing actually sets Lester Pickett apart an ability to make very fast racehorses run just that little bit faster. And the bigger the race, the faster they go. 100 yards to run in the derby, the minstrel coming to challenge Hot Grove, and it's Lester Pickett and Billy Carlton, the minstrel on the near side, Hot Grove on the last side, and the minstrel wins it from Hot Grove, blushing from his third. Lester Pickett has won the Epsom Derby an unprecedented nine times. He rode his first professional winner in 1948 when Harry Truman was president, Clement Attlee prime minister, when Don Bradman was still batting and Joe Lewis was champion of the world. Since then, this man who goes about his business with the eerie detachment and icy calm of a gunfighter has weighed in around the world, ever seeming aloof to the fact that his saddlebags are bulging with public esteem and the banknotes that invariably accompany it. A man's got to do what a man's got to do. Is that, in fact, what made him climb onto a horse in the first place? I didn't have any options. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, I never thought of anything else, really. Nor did his forebears. John Day was training racehorses two centuries ago. John Barham Day rode 16 classic winners Kate Day married Tom Cannon, who was first past the post over 1,500 times. And in 1903, Tom Cannon's daughter married Ernest Piggott, who won the Grand National twice on Perthland. They settled in the very heart of England at Letcombe Regis on the Berkshire Downs. Naturally, Ernie Piggott's son Keith also rode horses, 
and married Iris of the racing family Rickaby. They sired Lester, who was born on November the 5th, 1935. Dad was pleased he had a boy. In the wartime, I used to go around the, the gym corners and, and ride at them, you know. I wasn't uh, exceptional because uh, I could never get up on a horse. <laughs> I used to have these uh, optical races, I could never get back on the pony. After the Second World War, the family moved the few miles into Lambourne, and Keith climbed down from the saddle and started training horses at Southbank Stables. When we came to Lambourne, then he used to lead the what jumpers I had over the hurdles on his ponies, and uh, he used to work very well. And uh, uh, as Lester looked like making a jockey, I thought I'd have to get some flat races. And we started him riding when he was 12 in races. His first ride in apprentice race at Salisbury. The first win he rode was on the chase at Haydock Park uh, towards the end of the season. The budding genius was officially still at school, but his studies were increasingly unacademic. And as more winners followed, the core of the country boy's life was shifting. From being just one of the lads at his father's stables, he was fast becoming a public prodigy. Body Grace Course, and into the paddock comes 14-year-old Lester Piggott, who hopes to beat the Frank Wooden record of 55 winners before he's 15. In this race, he's riding no light and wins after a struggle by a length. But is it true, Lester, that you're after a more famous record, that of Gordon Richards? I do hope so, yes. And for father and son, the end of a perfect day at the races. But not everyone was enchanted with youth. Some were upset at the grown-up ferocity with which the boy drove his horses to the post. Around that time, you know, I, I did get suspended a few times, odd days, and, that, you know, and I think uh, every time something happened, they used to think it was me that did it. The most celebrated rumpus caused him to be banned from his father's stables. It followed the first of his victories in the Epsom Derby on Never Say Die in 1954. A few weeks later, on the same horse at Ascot, the 18-year-old Piggott challenged the sports then master, Sir Gordon Richards. Now, if anybody comes up on the inside, he's got no chance of getting out of trouble, and he's got no chance of getting through. Well, this is where Lester came. Now, he's only got one thing, he's got to push me out of the way, edge me out of the way. Well, uh, I was going as well as him, and he'd got no chance of doing that. And anyway, you're not supposed to do it because it is against the rules. He could see that I was going quite well and was, was beginning to, you know, I was going to be a danger to him. And, and when, he, when he passed these horses on the outside of them, he came over a bit, just to make sure that, you know, I didn't, didn't, get, didn't get there you know, and didn't have any room. Anyway, as it turned out, I got the blame for it, and, uh, and I got suspended for the fun. I wonder today, if I was riding, and I ran up into that pocket, and Lester was on the outside, do you think he'd pull out for me? Mr. Piggott travels the world in his search for winners. The west coast of America, the very cathedral of the consumer society where for an ordinary midweek meeting, the faithful flock to genuflect to sport and the dollar, and to see Piggott race their champion, the midget maestro, Willie Shoemaker. Let's see, well, he's probably got the best record of any rider living, uh, riding in different countries other than his own. I've been a winner or two in, uh, in New York and, uh, and Florida. 
But here uh, on the West Coast, uh, you know, it's a new experience to me, really, because I've only ever had one ride before. Hope you have a good trip. Good morning, Lester. Keep the flag flying, Lester. 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 You give them a good ride for me. She's a long straight fairy, but doesn't do anything wrong. We've got to go. <laughs> Such razzmatazz, such acclaim, had been fostered and cherished back home on the windswept heathlands at Newmarket, where years before the legendary trainer Noel Merlis had begun to seek a replacement for Gordon Richards, his aging comrade in triumph. Sir Noel sought the advice, too, of his most committed owners. And the Aga Khan came up with the best solution. He suggested that um, we took on a young boy, uh, either Manny Mercer or Lester Piggott. When his suspension finished, he started riding for me, which he continued to do for the next 11 or 12 years. He trained was, uh, with one thought in mind, to win the classic races. And the partnership truly and richly flourished. In 1957, Crepello gave the long-famed Merlis his first ever derby win. It was his 21-year-old jockey's second. And at that same derby meeting, the youngster tipped his cap to Her Majesty the Queen before taking out her carrozza in the Oaks. I always think that um, Esther's victory in carrozza was one of the greatest race that he ever rode in all his career. Into the straight, the other jockeys were challenging on the outside, they were challenging on the inside, but he never moved a muscle. And he still ran into the, into the dip just exactly where he was third. He moved up into second place, and he just gave her a little kick in the tummy, and, and she went and won. I swear that man never knew she'd had a race. It was one of the most perfect pieces of, of riding that I'd seen. Carrozza won the Oaks, but I, I think Lester had a lot to do with it. Noel Murnus steered Piggott to his first jockey's championship in 1960. In the same year, he married. His choice was true to the family tradition, for Susan was the daughter of Sam Armstrong, the celebrated Newmarket trainer. But as one happy partnership was formed, another was to break up. By 1966, Piggott had become disenchanted with the steady job. He turned freelance, and Dressing's establishment was shocked at his presumption. He'd ridden for me for 12 years, and actually I felt a bit aggrieved about him. Well, we always had a very good relationship. Uh, of course, over that period of time, you know, when we were a bit like that, of course, things, things were a bit stained. But, uh, you know, in retrospect, Lester was quite right to go and ride freelance. I mean, he got the best rides all over the world at that time. And I mean, he was 
absolutely dedicated to his profession and naturally very ambitious. We always remain best of friends. Go round, please. Rouse two, pick up four. Owners and trainers the world over were now jostling, keen to pay the new freelance to sit on their horses. So the boy from pastoral England was soon finding himself even more respected at the shrines of the sport in Ireland and in France. Whenever there was a chance of a good ride, Piggott was there, ever searching for that next classic winner. dawn, tomorrow's winner saunters home. It has ever been. The alarm call clatter of horses on gallops is gone. And even the shadows hold memories of the genius of those bleary jockeys, the brooding Fred Archer, the dazzling Donahue, and the ever so consistent forerunner to picket, Sir Gordon Richards. Gordon was a marvellous jockey. He used to come out the gate sitting on his bottom. Always used to be a length in front because they started letting, letting go when he was coming in, you know, they'd never leave him behind. I couldn't, you know, follow his way of riding because, you know, I was I was so much bigger than than he was. As I grew up, you know, I grew to be much taller. Uh, so I had to, you know, adapt a different style. I didn't teach him to ride the way he rides today. I taught him to ride the, the, the really, the old-fashioned way. As Pickett Sr. says, the old-fashioned way had young Lester sitting on his bottom with the stirrups long. The legs would balance the horse and keep him straight, which was crucial before starting stalls were used. Lester, at five feet seven inches, was far taller than most jockeys. He began riding shorter and shorter. His knees got higher and higher, and so did his bottom. His head remained perfectly still, but while balancing exactly the horse below him, he was changing imperceptibly his own centre of gravity every split second. The style has proved impossible to his imitators and exasperating to the purists. Racing journalist Tim Fitzgeorge Parker. Well, he does ride too short. Horses were invented a long time before Lester Piggott. He thinks that being in front of the point of balance is a good thing and it works for him. But the trouble is everybody imitates him. And you see stable lads, when they ride as short as that, they're always on the horse's mouth, naturally, because they haven't got Lester's sense of balance. And the impulsion must come from the whip, because there's nothing else. God gave you legs as a horseman to use to provide impulsion. Lester, the long fella, had developed his style to match his physique. There were other problems. He was born with a speech impediment, and he's rather hard of hearing. Well, I've, I've always been a bit deaf, um, as far as I can remember. Uh, I think the first time that anybody noticed it was when my father caught me with my ear up against the wireless. 
But I've heard funny tales about uh, when the old boys that he'd ridden winners for came up for, to him and said, uh, Sir, can I tap you for a pound on a windy day? So Lester would say, Well, come round the corner, I can't hear, it's too windy. So the old boy had changed his mind and said, uh, Can I touch you for two pounds for riding me a winner, sir? So he said, You said a pound in the first place. It's hard for a jockey to, to make to, you know, that much money because with the taxation as it is in this country and has been in the last 10 years, it's been very bad, you know. It's hard for even the, the best jockeys to save a lot of money. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's well known impossible. It seems that, you know, we, one year we, we make a lot of money and then <coughs> by the time of the next year, it's all gone, you know, taxation and, and takes, you know, 80-odd 80, 80 percent and this, that and the other, and we just don't seem to have that much, you know. But there's still a bit left over for Britain's richest jockey? No, not really, you know, make a good living, but uh, we, we don't make that much, you know. And if the winners continue to fly home, so do the perks as his good friend Teasy Weezy Raymond, the hairdresser, recalls of the night when Pig had won the Derby in 1957, when money was money. I invited him back to my den. The phone went. And it was the BBC. They wanted to interview him. So he looked at me, he said, what do I do? I said, make sure you get paid. And he put his hand over the mouthpiece and said, how much? I said, minimum 50 pounds. And his eyes lit up and uh, said, it'll cost you 50 pounds. And they agreed. Piggott doesn't make friends lightly and greatly cherishes his warm friendship with the Raymonds. Look at um, That wasn't all that well good, was it? No, better than this horse. Hmm? Better than this horse. Yeah. I know that you're not all that well bred, but see where you've got. <laughs> oh, poor Lester. <laughs> How can you say that? Well, you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> you, see, you have the odd turn up. <laughs> the odd turn up. Piggott's father, Keith, had trained Raymond's string of horses. Jointly, they owned and plotted and prayed for Ayala, now the memorable winner of that 1963 Grand National. When Lester was born, his father was still a jump jockey, and in his younger days, his son too had charged over wintry hurdles. It helped his technique and, crucially, kept his weight down for the summer. In all, he rode 20 national hunt winners. Whenever we, I had a jumper, uh, mainly herding at that time, Lester used to ride for me. And when I say rode for me, he rode four times over hurdles, and there were four winners. He never lost. Royal Ascot. But also elegant Midsummer Madness Ascot. Piggott, as you would expect, has long made a habit of winning the races that matter in this very best of company. Ikea in the 58 Gold Cup in front of the Queen of England herself. Gladness was trained by the new King of Ireland, Vincent O'Brien. County Tipperary, where another thunderous partnership was established with O'Brien, the master of Ballydoyle.
I, I feel that when he's actually riding a race, that he's sitting there as, as I'm sitting in this chair now, without the slightest fear or the slightest sign of nerves of any kind, and just sees what's, what's going on around him. Many a successful Epsom raid has been hard hatched here at Ballyd Oil, O'Brien's lair below the Rock of Cashel. Now one of history's most cunning trainers of a horse and probably history's finest rider had come together. But more even. Two such sporting businessmen were bound to be a riveting attraction to, well, other sporting businessmen who loved the turf but whose talent was investment. Money breeds horses and money breeds money and O'Brien helped Piggott to understand the fact. Nijinsky was trained here, and Sir Ivor too. Lester Piggott coming with a great challenge towards the outside, but it's Connaught the leader. Connaught as they race up towards the line from Sir Ivor in second. Sir Ivor gaining on Connaught as they race towards the line. Sir Ivor's going to take it up, and up the line, Sir Ivor's won the derby. And then from behind in the Washington International. Piggott was to show America the way home twice more in this, their classic challenge. At Ballyd Oil, in the very hills the ancient kings of Munster ruled, O'Brien and Piggott worked their double magic to multiply the millions the hard-headed syndicate had invested. After his second win in Paris's Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, alleged was sold for almost 10 million pounds, and then the game was to find next year's Piggott winners. Now this horse, that's true, he's a fine big colt. And he's by Nijinsky, and he's out of an own sister too, a secretary. Good limbs. Mm -hmm. Nice quality. Mm -hmm. Hope he doesn't hope he doesn't go too big. He's a big he's you know, he's a big horse already. Mm -hmm. Let's see when he was foaled. It was uh, 22nd of March. He's pretty quite nearly foaled. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, he is. Well, he'd need to be. He cost plenty. Mm. Cost a million four mm. dollars. Mm. I'd probably if you just let him walk down about a dozen steps. First, there's tomorrow's, or next week's ride to arrange, to fix, to catch. What freelance doesn't need a telephone? Yeah, okay. He's saw the right horse, he knows the right horse he wants to ride. Billy and, Carson. Um, he's used to telephone a lot. And uh, if he, the trainer won't let him ride it, he'll ring the owner. And he'll get the owner, he'll work on the owner, he might ring the owner up two or three times before they'll say yes. And. Um, He's rode some hell of a good horses that way. Contentiously, he acquired an 11th hour ride on Roberto on the far side. In this, his tightest derby win in 1972. Ryan Gold and Roberto. Roberto inching his way back as they come to the line. It's a photo finish, Roberto and Ryan Gold. He might have a speech impediment, but by Christ, when he's on that telephone, you wouldn't think so. Well, I think so, you know, but... Uh, be 500 each, you know. 500 each. It rings continuously during the racing season, morning, noon and night. Susan Piggott. And uh, it's, I suppose, an occupational hazard, but there's always got to be someone there to answer it. And if Lester himself has already left for the races, then it's up to me or the secretary to take the messages. I suppose it uh, would do about 40,000 miles a year. I think racing people, as a whole, are the best drivers about. But, uh, you know, obviously they, they're a bit inclined to go a bit too fast. And, uh, and so most of them have been off at one time or another, you know. I think I've had three suspensions. Uh, I think three months and, uh, and six months twice. But uh, it's been over a period of... Uh, well, uh, you know, getting on for 30 years. 
I don't think that's too bad, really, you know? Not too bad either are the Piggott plans for retirement. His affluent bungalow home stands just a canter away from the course at Newmarket, horse racing's capital, and its monarch has already built himself a spread of stables. He's ready to become a trainer like all his forefathers. Not that they had swimming pools. Lester and Susan have two daughters. They're now grown up, so Susan can develop her own career. Of course, it's horses. She runs her own bloodstock agency. Bid if you want him. 1250, 1300, 1400, 1500, 1500, opposite, 50 for you, 1500, done. Obviously, traveling so much, uh, the girls haven't seen possibly as much of uh, Lester as they might have done if he'd been a nine to five man. But then it's been compensated with um, being able to take them traveling with us on occasions when their school holidays permitted, and this we have done over the years since they were quite tiny. He takes an enormous interest in Maureen's eventing and in Tracy's uh, love of racing. She rides out for my brother Robert. Whenever he's able to go and see Maureen at an event, he does so, but her season runs concurrently with ours. So it, it's not always easy for him to see her ride. Maureen shows rich promise as an inventor. The line from old John Day goes on. In the European midwinter, jockeys, like swallows, migrate to warmer waters. Hong Kong for a holiday some sightseeing, and an inevitable cigar. Year in, year out, week in, week out, at work or play, our jockey must watch his weight, and a cigar helps stave off those pangs of hunger. Pigot has lived his adult life, two stones underweight. Good morning, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to order another suit. What kind of material you like? How about this one? Very nice, isn't it? I think it's the... Uh, this is probably the best, you know? Yeah. It's nice, lots of planner. No Olympus. Oh, very nice, isn't it? I think we'll have to measure me up for this one. OK, thank you. Even some time for a holiday job at Sha Tin Racecourse. Once, this was just sea. The teeming crowds have built shot in. But then there's one god, money. In the nerve center of China's commercialism, Money pours in for doubles, trebles, six-ups, and quinellas. One million pounds is wagered on each and every race. Who cares, then, if Piggott or anyone else wins, unless you back the horse? American Eagle fighting back on the inside. Grass up a green just in front and felling by a nose to American Eagle. All flaps selected. On holiday, it's still business before pleasure. His manager comes too. 
this is something that I want to show you. It's the cover of the All Stars brochure that we're designing. What we've got is a pyramid design on the top of it. This is a picture of yourself. Probably be some shots on it of Susan, if she agrees. Do you agree? Excuse me, Mr. Piggott. Would you care for the hot breakfast? The pancake, I think. The pancake? Even on holiday, you have to watch your diet. Would you care for a couple or something? Some maple syrup, Would you care for any bacon with the uh, pancakes, sir? Would you care for anything else with that? Thank you very much. On this trip now, you know, it's taking 15 hours, you know. Not too bad, you know. I think, I think the longest, um, probably the longest flight I had was when uh, I arrived in farm uh, one day and flew, flew to uh, Washington the next day. And road the day after that, and then the day after I left for Japan. In a matter of four days, you know, I've ridden in three countries across the world. Auckland, for one of the country's richest races. At least jockeys can occasionally socialise on holiday. Let's get Barry and Soda. Brandy and Soda. <laughs> so I gave him a ring, I thought, oh, you know, and uh, he came along and he got his, put his wife out at the gate and told her to look after me. And... Our Sandy's home for my money, look, that's two to pick it. There's a golf course. Uh, I'm not into golf. Uh, I go swimming. Uh, oh, well, well there's a pool. Is there? Oh, yeah. The big one? Yeah. Oh, just the right size. Yeah, right. <laughs> I've been down here. I know. <laughs> Well, I saw him at the Regent in Sydney, and you go around to the dressing room, which is all kind of with a corrugated iron roof in this theatre in Sydney, and there's Johnny Mathis, lives in this big 14-bedroom house, I suppose he does, in Bel Air, in playing Las Vegas, and then he was in this room with a corrugated iron roof, you know. It's like over the jumps at Fonkel, I think. He rides Arboshane in the big race. odd moonlighting ride does help keep those surplus pounds under control, especially if there's a decent wage packet to help the holidays swing along. Red and black also, number six is March Legend. David Peek aboard. Look for the highest bottom. Soon it'll be back to England and the quest for another Derby winner. There's just one more day of the horseman's winter holiday. Couldn't get a better jockey than that to ride a horse, could you? Hi. Mind you, this is the best one, isn't it? <laughs> Did I get you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you caught it too, that's great. <laughs> Would you like it to get on it? Fish drain glass. Looks right too. Well, good help. Cheers. Thanks, man. Thank you. You can see the blue water out there? Yeah. See the 
water's very slippy in here and uh, everybody's going out to it. There'll be more life out there. On the pad, an appeal from Croft refused by Mr. Hasty. Western Indians have tried very hard for dismissals, both from the, by means of LBWs and caught behind throughout this innings, without any success whatever. Yeah, I know you're a strong hero. lose a fish. But now back to that relentless search for a Derby ride. Derby mourn with now just a handful of hours left before you know if you've made the right choice. It's always, uh, it always has been a, you know, a bad trip to get to the Derby. I've known when, you know, I've had to get out and, and run the last mile, because it's just been impossible to get, get the car through. <laughs> In 57, I rode Capello. I've always thought it was, was the biggest certainty I've ever ridden in the Derby. He is, he's one of the best. Yeah. He's going to win the Derby today. Survivor, who, who gave me a great ride. The best of, of the horses that I've, I've won the Derby on. I should have a 10 on him in a minute. And then after that, 10, uh, the Jinky. On the day of the derby, he, he was a, a super horse. Just around that time, you know, I, I think he was unbeatable. We're all bigger men, yes. And now we come to this one. <laughs> so late after they're waiting. No photographs, please. What about? Not a horseman, but I bet him because he wins. That's why. Okay, I think there's about five or six horses that have a very good chance. They're on form, you know, there's, there's not much between them. There's Troy, Elamanimo, Capon Wood, Lee Fireswish, and uh, probably Nolino. There's not a lot to shoot between those, those five horses, I suppose, five or six horses. It is a great honour to be riding Milford for the Queen, especially in this 200 derby. Race card, 
Dick Hearn, the trainer, nervously awaits Milford to introduce him to his owner and his jockey. Everything has been done. Now it's just up to Pickett and Milford, of course. Derby course is a careering one and a half mile switchback. No one understands the roller coaster better than Pickett, and from the start it seemed he and Milford were doing everything right for Queen and Country. Ah well, there's always another year. But as the Queen's horseman drove home that night to his already furnished Newmarket stables, he knew in his heart there couldn't be too many years left. He was in middle age now, and even he could not continue to outride the inevitable down every final furlong. A freak series of accidents and injuries had the gods underlining the point. But the amazing fellow turned his deaf ear, remounted to dead pan, and as a totem to the nation, carried home the flag for another sensational and record ninth derby victory around the roller coaster rim of Epsom's Downs. And he made pretty sure, too, that it will be a long, long time, if ever, before any rider beats his tally of 29 classic wins. And so it seems England's classics master bows out, but not with the yawning sigh of a retired Mr. Chips. Pickett is setting about a new career of training racehorses, which many say is a thousandfold more difficult than the riding of them. Now he has swapped the prancing thoroughbreds in the afternoon paddocks for the gently docile trainer's hack on the misty dawn gallops.
he will, of course, still be perched cat-like on the horse's back, just as he was all those years ago at Haydock Park when he rode that first winner on August the 18th, 1948. And his mother told the reporter from the Daily Express, he's just an ordinary boy, really. Even mother didn't realize. Lester Pickett, ordinary? The nation knew better. All hail and farewell.